If we say that we have no sin, now this is a new thought. Underline verse 8. I'm going to talk to you in just a second. So John begins this first portion essentially describing the gospel that Jesus provided for, for the new believing church, for the new covenant people. And then all of a sudden in verse 8, he changes gears and we don't even know it for the most part. Verse 8, it says, if we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. How many believers here today know that we are not without sin? Right? Is that pretty much a given? Who in the right now? Watch this. How many predated born again believers before you got saved knew that, you know what? I'm not without sin. I sin. Right? So when we read a statement like that, we usually pass right over and say, well, that's idiotic. That's a, that's, that's a given. We know that. Why is he putting that in there? Look at verse 9. If we confess our sins, underline verse 9, this is the one verse that the Bar of Soap Theology is based on. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness if we say that we have not sinned we make him a liar and his word is not in us verse 10 is the same as verse 8 and in the middle is verse 9 which is the, the bar of soap theology is based entirely on now watch this this is important what in the world is verse 8 and 10 in there for why would John bring the thought that everybody already knew I mean yeah, everybody knows that we're not, not without sin. Everybody knows that. Except in that day, a sect of people called Gnostics. Now, the Gnostics had two basic beliefs, okay? The Gnostics believed that, number one, that Jesus was a spirit only and did not dwell in the flesh on the earth. Now, we in Christianity understand that he is spirit, but he did dwell on the earth in flesh. Amen, right? We know that to be true. But the Gnostics just believed that he was a spirit and that he really wasn't fleshly or didn't have any flesh or in, in body. The second thing that the Gnostics, their core belief was simply this. They didn't believe in sin. They didn't believe that sin was sin and sin even existed. They believed that every single person on the planet, according to their belief, didn't sin because there was no such thing. Are, are you with me? So when John wrote verses 8 and 10, he specifically was pointing out to the Gnostics, there's light and there's darkness and there is sin and every single person deals and has sin. And we can go back to the book of Romans when Paul talks about that all have fallen short of the glory of God. All have sinned, right? And so when he wrote verse 8 and 10, he was purposely going for the Gnostics. Now watch this. The Bar Soap Theology Scripture, 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, the whole premise is that chapter 1 is written to believers. That's, what it's, that's, that's the core belief of the Bar Soap Theology, is that chapter 1 is written to believers. I kind of have a problem with that, number one. And the easiest way to explain it is to look in chapter or verse 9 itself. It says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and he is righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. As a born-again believer, I was made righteous when Jesus died and resurrected from the dead. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and 30 is Jesus became, he gave us righteousness as a free gift. My spirit that's in me, my spirit is declared righteous because Jesus has made it righteous. So the idea of unrighteousness directly leads to a person who has not been saved. So their whole theology is debunked in the very verse that they use and that I used to use. Amen. Are y'all here? The other point I'd like to make about this is look at very first verse in chapter 2. My little children, I am writing these things to you. He starts off this chapter 2, my little children. Now we're shifting 
to the believers. He did not start off this letter. He did not start off verse 1 saying, my little children. He started off chapter 1 by showing the Gnostics that they were absolutely wrong in both of their thinking. That Jesus indeed came with spirit and his spirit, but came and and dwelled in flesh form. And that he also declared that there is sin. All have sinned. So the point of John writing this, and and you can go, if you want to go and research this, you can go look at pretty much any commentary and begin to read that this first chapter is indeed talking about people that are not saved. I would like to look at chapter 1 verse 9 is that point when you have that sinner's prayer. When you come down and for the first time that you're receiving Christ Jesus. And when you come, watch this, this is amazing. Look at it again. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins. He's faithful and righteous to forgive us. Watch this. When we come down, and this is amazing, because when you look, when you begin to look at chapter 1, the context is, again, pointing out to the Gnostics that all have sinned. In keeping with that context, what John is referring to is not a person coming down and giving a laundry list of all the sins that they can remember so that they can be saved. How many people here, when you said the Lord's Prayer, if you will, or the, the sinner's prayer, excuse me, the sinner's prayer, How many of you came down to an altar, came down front or wherever you were, and you were told to confess your sins, and you begin to confess all your sins? How many left out a few of them that you forgot? You bunch of liars, raise your hand, be honest. I'm quite certain you forgot a few sins. How about the ones you didn't even know you did commit? Because you were insane, mad, and angry at the time, and you forgot some of the sins. So it's not John is saying... Bring your, your list of sins so you, you can be forgiven. The context is he's saying, look, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Gnostics, there is sin. So when you come and you say the sinner's prayer, you are saying, God, you know what? I am a sinner by nature because of Adam. Not because I've sinned, but because of Adam. Period. All right, are you with me? So... This whole bar of soap theology is based on one verse that is totally out of whack. And what we're about to find out is the truth. We're about to find out what the Word of God really says about this new covenant. Watch this. This is important. This verse declares that it's up to us to do something to gain forgiveness. The bar of soap theology That verse, they base it on that, that it's up to us as believers to do something to release forgiveness in our life. I preached this for years, guys. Many of you probably here and many of you probably came down and recommitted your life 12 times in a week, 12 weeks in a row. Because you just didn't feel righteous. You didn't feel like you were overcoming. Your behavior said that you weren't righteous. And so you felt the need to come grab the bar of soap, wash up, be cleansed so that you can start fresh again until the next Sunday, until the preacher reads your mail again. And then you come forward, and once again, I need to do something. And the doing something, according to the bar of soap theology, is confessing. That is the doing something. If I confess my sins as a born-again believer, then God will release Forgiveness in my life. Turn to Hebrews chapter 10. We're about to see the truth right now. Look at your neighbor and say, aren't you glad the truth shall set you free? Again, the bar soap theology is based entirely on us to do something to gain forgiveness. It's up to us. And now, in these, this day and age, there's different methods to do something to get something from God. Amen? Are y'all here? I got to settle down. I get really excited about this. It's liberating. Hebrews chapter 10. We're going to read starting in verse 1. I want us to see this. I I read this, I think, the last time I introduced this idea, which has been a while back. I want to kind of build on that message. It says, I love this, man. I love the book of Hebrews, man. It just, it settles and talks about the old covenant and the new covenant. It tells us about these better promises. Look at verse 1, Hebrews. It says, for the law 
since it has only a shadow of good things to come. It does not have good things to come. It is a shadow of good things to come. And not the very form of things can never by the same sacrifices year by year, which they offer continually, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered because the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have had a consciousness of sins? But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins year by year. Underline that. You probably already have it underlined. But underline that's important. But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins year by year. The Bar Soap Theology could say this. There's a reminder of sins every Sunday. Right? Are y'all with me? Verse 4. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Therefore, when he comes into the world, he says, Sacrifice and offering thou hast not desired, but a body thou hast prepared for me. In whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come. In the role of the book, it is written of me to do thy will, O God. Now, verse 8, look at this. After saying above, sacrifices and offerings and whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast not desired, nor hast thou taken pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. Verse 9. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do thy will. He takes away the first in order to establish the second. Stop. The whole first section, he brings up the Old Testament, the law, if you will, of the sacrificial system. Right? How many know that there was something in the Old Testament, you can look in Leviticus, you can look in the law, that there was an atonement, if you will, a covering of sins by ways of blood of bulls and goats. Y'all remember this, right? In the Old Testament, once a year, a family, the head of the family, would bring a sacrifice that had, uh, it had to be a blood offering. And they would go into the priest. The priest, the, the leader of the family would put his hand upon that, that sacrifice. And the priest would slash the throat. And there would begin to be blood. And they would take that blood. And the priest would end up taking all this blood into the Holy of Holies. Where the, what? Where the Ark of the Covenant was. And they would sprinkle this blood on the Ark of the Covenant. And every year, this is what it would look like. Every year, the family of the family would go in there, and they would do this, and they would walk out, watch this, and the sins for all that previous year were covered. And so this is what it would look like. Sacrifice happened. Woo! And you're walking out the door. My sins of last year are covered. What about this year? Are you serious? I got to wait a whole nother, because I know I'm going to sin. I just sinned. Oh, my gosh. I got to wait a whole year. And for a year, guilt, condemnation would eat one up because there was no means of forgiveness. No means. That's what, that's what he's talking about in this first portion. And then he said, watch this. And he says this. Did you not know, and this is the whole point of this, the only thing that brings about forgiveness of sins, watch this, this is important. Old Testament, New Testament. The only thing that produces forgiveness of sins is blood. Blood. It's a blood system. In the old, it was the blood of bulls and goats. In the new, it's the blood of the lamb who was slain. Right? It's a blood system. Watch this. It never was, in the Old Testament, an apology, an apology system. The only thing that produces forgiveness is blood. This is important. Write that down. It's important. It's not a confession. It's not an apology. It's always been blood, period. The head of the family did not walk it to the priest with a sacrifice and begin to confess all the sins. Didn't do it. Why? Because it didn't do any good. 